Welcome to episode one. I am Nick. I'm here with Jeff. Jeff is from the Bay Area, graduated from San Francisco State before moving to Los Angeles in the early 2000s. Big A's fan, and his least favorite team is? The San Francisco Giants. Screw the Giants. <laughs> so we, we Dodger fans be... have something in common. Yeah. Me and uh, me and Giants fans have something in common because I do not like the Dodgers at all. <laughs> Cannot stand going to Dodger Stadium. But we're going to talk to you about baseball movies, what we liked, what we didn't like, and discuss some of our favorites. So today what we're discussing right is two classics in either way you want to look at it. We're going to start with Moneyball, and then we're going to finish up with The Sandlot. Um, because Jeff's an A's fan and because I love this movie, we're going to start with Moneyball. Now, Jeff, what do you remember from that twenty, from that 2002 season? Yeah, that 2002 season, man. I, I lived it. I was there. I was there for um, all of it. I was at game. I was not at 20 when they went to hit the 20th thing, but I was at 10. I went to 10 and 11 that year. I think it was 10 and 11, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, that was the year after, you know, Giambi left, Johnny Damon left. Uh, we had Jermaine die. I think he got hurt. I think he hit the ball off his leg in the previous pre uh, postseason. Um but, um, you know, you still had Tejada, you still had Chavez, you still had, you know, guys like that who were still, you know, doing really good. And, you know, and I just remember, you know, it started off slow, it's slow for, you know, I think they were still above 500. You know, I think the movie makes it out, the book even makes it out to be like they were you know, this horrible, horrible team, you know, 20 games under, you know, under 500 going to all-star break, which that really wasn't the case. They were, you know, definitely uh, underachieving, but compared to the previous couple of years, um, but I mean, they were still right in the thick of it. You know, like I said, they try to dramatize it a little much saying they were this horrible club, but you know, anytime you got, uh, you know, Zito Hudson and Mulder as your starting pitchers, you're never going to be out of it, which are obviously not mentioned much <laughs> in the book or the movie. Um, you know, Zito, uh, actually won the Cy Young that year and Tejada won the MVP, I believe, uh, they both won those in 2002. So, um, you know, like I said, I, I've read the book many times. Um, I've seen the movie multiple times. I went, I went opening night for the movie with all my A's gear. I made my wife put all her A's gear too. We were in the theater with all A's, A's geared out. So, um, yeah, definitely fond memories of that time. Going to the Coliseum, it was rocking. Uh, place was packed. It was great. Day games were packed. We used to go on Wednesdays too, where it was like a dollar to get in. Um, and then a uh, dollar hot dog. So uh, sitting in the top deck by the third inning, you can move down, <laughs> you know, on the field level, basically. So it was really cool. Good times back then. Yeah, it's one of my favorite movies. You know, I'm really big on Brad Pitt, Jonah Hill. You know, Philip Seymour Hoffman plays Art Howe. You've got Chris Pratt yeah. playing Hatterberg. And being a Braves fan, you know, I I knew where Tim Hudson had come from. But growing up, I was a big David Justice fan. You know, that guy, he had yeah. such a sweet swing. And he was part of those worst of first Braves. He won the 91 Rookie of the Year. And so for me, that movie kind of clued me in as to what happened and how he kind of bounced around from Cleveland to the Yankees, to the A's, and what his role was on that team, you know? And I just, you know, you go back to that scene where he walks into the common room with... Uh, with Chris Pratt's character, Scott Hatterberg, and he's like, what are you afraid of? He's like, the ball. Ball. Oh, seriously. <laughs> yeah, seriously, yeah, the ball. Hit anywhere in my direction. Like, dude, you were a catcher. How are you afraid of the ball? You know, and it, it just, it goes to show you how quickly things can change with a professional where you're, the mental aspect of it comes in. Um, yeah, that's, some things that's about totally that movie true. That, yeah, what were some things about that movie that you thought you know, not necessarily if it were fabricated, and I know you touched on that, but you thought could have been better. Um, Art Howe, he really got a bad rap. Um, he really got a bad rap in that, I think. You know, obviously he is definitely from the old school. Um, and, and the movie needs a villain. You know, every movie needs, you know, an antagonist to go against the protagonist. So it, Art Howe, I think, was made to be a kind of the fall guy, the, the kind of the escape, you know, the, the scapegoat, the bad guy of the movie you know, the old fogey who, you know, the, the old kind of the overweight, the old fogey co manager of a baseball team, very old school, doesn't want to do things, will play the guys that look right and sound right and, you know, can hit singles and bunt people over. Um, which, you know, that was a lot of in the eighties and even the nineties, that was that was the thinking. But 
you know, I don't, I don't, I remember like reading the papers and stuff. I, I don't remember Art Howe, you know, coming off as this grumpy old man. It, it didn't seem like that to me from the interviews that I remember, you know, back reading the, the, you know, the San Francisco Chronicle or the Argus, the Fremont Argus, you know, the interviews that I saw and I read and what I'd read for the reports, the, you know, the paper the next day, it quotes from him. He didn't seem like that type of guy. So I think he got a, he got a kind of a raw deal on that. I think he's even came out and said something about that. Um, yeah. And then obviously the Jonah Hill character, I thought that was really actually really well done. He played, he was so good in that. Um, but you know, that was a different name. That was always supposed to be Paul De Podesta, who went on to go to the Dodgers GM. Um, so they had to change the name. I can't remember why they changed the name. I think, I want, I want to say uh, De Podesta didn't let him. I think he didn't sign off on letting him use his name or anything, um, which is kind of interesting because he's in the book. So I don't know why you wouldn't want that. But I thought that was kind of interesting. <clears throat> um, but yeah, when you talk about like the David Justice, he he was a little bit in the book. I, I really don't even remember him being mentioned like that scene and the Hatterberg stuff wasn't that part, of, that part wasn't really in the book, if I remember correctly. Um, I mean, Hatterberg is definitely very prominent in the book um but not so much um his like defensive prowess it was more about his offensive skills they really talked about um you know we want to do who's we don't care if he hits a home run we want he's going to hit singles and doubles and i think there's in the book it said something to the effect of like i think billy bean said something i'm paraphrasing but something if i could get you know nine scott hatterbergs in the lineup i'm going to beat you every day if I just put nine and clone them and just run them up there all day, <laughs> every game, I'm going to beat you, you know, nine, nine times out of 10. Cause the dude just was on base all the time and hitting line drives all over the field. And then obviously hit the, you know, the home run and went to get the 20th game. Um, but yeah. And, and then, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the book nor the movie really mentioned the pictures at all. Um, you know, I mean, that's, it, it's very hard to overlook and that is definitely one flaw. And, <laughs> You know, I mean, that was the, the core of the A's teams. It was the pitching. I mean, there's the, I even have a book and it's called the big three of uh, Hudson, Mulder and Zito and talking about the last year, uh, which was 2002, that they were all together. Or I'm sorry, 2003 was last year together. Is that right? Yeah. One, zero, yeah, one, Hudson two, three. Yeah. The Braves. Yeah. The Braves for a fair amount of time before he went to the Giants and won a World Series with the Giants. Yeah. That's right, because 2003 uh, was the last year, because 2004, they didn't make the playoffs. So 2003 was the last year. I think 2000, yeah, something like that. So, yeah, so no, no mention of them. I think they're briefly, like, in the background of the movie. But they're, I feel like they're just mentioned in passing in the book. So that, that is definitely one thing from, um, you know, from that was the play on the field and the results on the field weren't really reflected on the book or the movie. And that was something that I would have liked to see a little bit more of because how good Barry Zito was for such an extended oh, period man. of time, how good Mark Mulder was and how consistent Tim Hudson was, you know, and we'll talk about that clip that we saw him in, in trouble with the curve in another episode. But, you know, you do look at those things and, you know, chicks dig the long ball, but pitching wins the games, <laughs> you know, you can't talk about that Braves game the other night where it's 16 to 13, like what the heck happened? How do you give up so many <laughs> runs and, who's going to win? And I told somebody, I was like, oh yeah, the, the Cardinals won by a field goal over the Falcons. What? what? <laughs> so, yeah. and then when you're looking at, you know, going back to Scott Hatterberg, he had 138 hits in 136 games with an OPS of 807 that year. You know, David Justice had an OPS of 785 and he played 118 games. So they yeah. did want guys to get on base. And I watched, I've seen that movie a couple times. Um, as a baseball fan, it's one that you fall in love with based on getting behind the scenes and seeing what goes into it, you know, and I know fantasy football and fantasy baseball, you want guys that are going to get hits, drive in runs and do the right things. But this movie takes you away from all the movies that we grew up with, The Natural, Sandlot, Bull Durham. It goes into why teams are the way they are and how to continue that. And then we see, you know, the Red Sox take that formula and win a World Series with it in 2004. They win three World Series in nine yep. years. So. Yep, yep. Using, using the, as it says at the end, using basically the basic formula. And I, I don't know if this is true. I, I don't remember where I heard this before, but, you know, at the end of the movie, you know, Billy Bean basically gets that the job offer for, uh, for the Red Sox. And from what I, I can't, I never, I don't know if I've ever verified it, but I feel like I heard it somewhere on a, maybe on a, on a talk show back then, or maybe somebody said, I don't know, but I heard 
there's an urban legend that Billy Bean had, he already had a trade set up. Manny Ramirez was going to come to the A's. He was going to trade Manny Ramirez away as the Red Sox GM to the A's for, I don't remember who it was for, but he, the A's were going to get Manny Ramirez and the, the Red Sox were going to get a bunch of like Scott Hatterberg types. He was going to like go away from the power and go with, you know, get, you know, like, I don't know, let's say it's Hatterberg or something like that. But yeah, it was definitely, he said he already had it in place. He got to like work with the guy who, took, who was going to take over. I can't remember his name, but um, yeah, that, that's an old urban legend uh, that Billy Bean was ready to trade Manny Ramirez, which that might change the course of history right there. I mean, maybe the Red Sox don't even win, you know, without Manny. Um, you know, that would have been wild <laughs> if that yeah, would have, would have actually happened. Later. And a couple years later, you get Manny in LA, and it's just Manny mania here. Oh, Manny would. I, mean, was, I went. To, I went to one of those games. That was. I remember being at one of those games as well, and that was. It was a lot of fun. I forget it, who. I feel like they were playing the Phillies, and a friend of mine asked me if I wanted to go, and I was like, "Oh, this is just. This is crazy." You know, it was kind of like Hideo Nomo. You know, you're going back <laughs> to the mid '90s where everybody's just, you know, cuckoo for cocoa puffs about this guy. And he doesn't yep. really do much. They lose to the Cubs in the first round of the playoffs, but you know, good for them to, to the get some behind something. <laughs> yeah. All right. We are moving on to one of the timeless baseball movies, The Sandlot. You know, the Sandlot. Going on, this movie probably came out. I was probably eight or nine. And when you look at it, what year? What year did it come out? What What, what year is it? Ninety two? No, ninety. What year did it come out? 93? That's a good question. What we have to look that up. <laughs> it was early. I thought oh, I printed that out. Let's see. 93. 93. Wow. Yeah. So I was 14 then. I was probably like 14. So this movie comes out in 93. Um, you know, I was very much into baseball at that time. You were 14. You were going into high school. What do you remember about this movie when it came out? Oh, it, it, you know, it reminded me of Little League, playing Little League, you know, just a few years earlier than that, um, you know, with my buddies. And then, and it really, you know, the good thing about Sandlot is that, you know, it could be about anything. It could be about any sport. You know, we didn't necessarily, when we were kids, I, I don't know about you, but we, we played more football, I would say. We would go out to the street because it's a ball. We got the whole street, you know, cars would come every once in a while and we do the whole, you know, the, 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 the Wayne's World thing, game on, game off. Um, you know, but we did more, but, but, you know, it applies. It's the same thing. It's getting together with your buddies, running around in the summer, playing sports, going to pool. We used to go to the pool just like that. The one with Wendy Peppercorn. There was even a Wendy Peppercorn, uh, you know, girl there that was like that, that we were all just like, oh God, she's the hottest girl I've ever seen in our entire lives. Like <laughs> we would go to the public pool. It was, I mean, that was, you know, I think that took place in like the sixties, I think. I mean, growing up in the, you know, the eighties and, and early nineties like that, it was, I mean, it's almost the same. We rode our bikes everywhere. We went and played sports. We went to the park and we played basketball. We played, you know, sometimes we played baseball. We bring a wiffle ball and stuff. Or like I said, it was mostly football that we bring around. But um, you know, I just remember that time. It, it really brought you back as a kid and you could really relate to it. Um, you know, as you saw it as your, as, at your age of eight, eight, nine, and me looking back and just a few years previous, um, you know, it, it really brought the nostalgia back, you know, and, and um, yeah, it was really great. I love that. What about you? What's your what was your thought? Because you were probably that was probably right in your sweet spot. They were probably just a few years older than you. You were probably right in that little league era, I, right? I remember I remember playing a lot of baseball when I was a kid. One of my friends, he uh he was really into baseball as well. And so we would play all the time. You know, he had tryouts with the Giants, he had tryouts with the Padres, but we would always play baseball. It was baseball, football, and basketball for us you know yeah. and i remember <laughs> it was for football it was light pole to light pole for baseball yeah we used his front yard and we had somebody's fence as a home run and if you hit it over the fence you know great and i remember crashing into the fence one time trying to catch a fly <laughs> ball but um you know the whole babe ruth scene where it's like oh you mean that wimpy deer no you know <laughs> as a kid you grow up and yeah. if you're a baseball fan. I have an uncle who he would tell me stories about Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and all the greats because his his uncle was an umpire back in New York back uh -huh. in the 30s and 40s. And so oh, wow. I got to hear a lot of those stories from him and my grandfather because when my family came here from New York, that's what it was about. It wasn't it wasn't about anything else. There was no 
you know, okay, cool, we're going to tell you about this. Like, no, I was, I was like Ray Kinsella. I grew up to stories of Babe Ruth and Shoeless. <laughs> you know, I wish I grew up to stories of Shoeless Joe, but nobody was alive back then. You know, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, Ted Williams, Mickey Mantle, Joe DiMaggio, just all those legends. And for me, this movie, you kind of, it is timeless. It's one of those movies where yeah. my kids watch it now, like, wow, how old are these kids? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the one thing that I didn't like in this movie was, you know, you can it's it's a cinematic thing, but you've got the kids where they're hitting the ball. They're they're hitting the ball and it's a home run, but you could tell that they're hitting it to right field or you could tell they're just getting a piece of it. And yeah. it's like, cool. That's the if there's one thing that I don't like about this movie, it's that. That's it. It's not like you're going to do retake after retake. Okay, cool. I need you to square this ball up. How hard is that? You're trying to hit a round bat and a round ball. No. So that, to me, that's really it. The soundtrack on this movie <laughs> is amazing. And you know what I just thought of? The one thing that every time I hear tequila, the one thing that I think of is that scene where they all try to, and they all yeah. throw up on the tumbler. And so for me, if it's two things that I don't like about that movie, it's that it's the memory of going on a roller coaster ride like that and losing Chow and the cinematic differences that, you know, you're you're asking kids to to hit a baseball. So what about? Yeah, you? that's what true, because they should be right there. Right. They should be right. I mean, like you said, it's to square this up it, and it's, you know, the, the frame is right. They're right. They're standing right there. It's not like they're pitching from 90 feet away. Yeah. Let's get this squared up. Yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. The montage scene where they're like destroying that one team. Right. The ball's all flying all over the place. Yeah. You can never. Yeah. Nobody's pulling it. <laughs> you play ball like a girl. Yeah. Plus, that sand law was huge. Like to hit that ball over the fence. I mean, good lord. I don't even know if I can yeah, do that yeah. now. That that was a big. That that always bothered me. Like we always thought, like that's far. <laughs> There's some guys that we played against that can hit the ball that far, but you know, we're we're talking late 30s, early 40s now. Yeah, yeah. Um, where do these movies rank in your top 10? If you could, if you had to slot them in among all the movies sure. that we're going to talk about, where would they? Where would the Moneyball and the Sandlot rank? Man, let's see. I mean, Major League is is my number one. That movie is I've probably seen that one, uh, like of of top five movies of all time. I remember watching that when I was a kid. I'm sure we'll talk about that another time, which is probably inappropriate when my mom let me watch it when I was a kid. But anyway, um, Sandlot probably ranks higher just because I've seen it so many times. I, I saw it when I was a kid. I watched it with like you said. I've watched it with my kids too, and they love it. Um, did you know there's multiple? There's like Sandlot two and three, I think too. Did you know that? There We've is, even seen yeah, those. On, it is rough. On Disney Plus. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's rough. They're it's rough. Kind of, it's kind of like Major League Three. Like a, you know, I watched it just yeah. for the, you know, just because three. Jefferson Darfy, Darcy is in it. But yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's really it. You know, there's nothing. Think, don't they go back in time, or is it a body swap or something like that? In number three of Sandlot, isn't it like? Doesn't it go back in time? Isn't it Luke Perry? Right? I, I mean, that's a great one? question, and I'd have to look at it, but I don't think that's <laughs> going to be this. It's, it's not even getting an honorable mention, dude. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, so I would say of the movies that we had that list going, I would say Sandlot's probably, man, it's probably like three, maybe? Okay. Two or three? It's, it's definitely up there. It's not number one. Um, I like League of Their Own a lot. If we're considering that a base. I mean, it's obviously baseball. I really like that movie. Moneyball. I'd probably say Sandlot and Moneyball are probably three and four or four and five, somewhere there. They're real close to each right. other. Those are probably the two okay. hot there. I got to give Moneyball to love just because, I mean, that's my team. That's, I've, I've read, like I said, I lived it. I read the book before, you know, before the movie came out. And obviously that's about my team and for my maybe soon to be old team. We'll see how that shakes out. But <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would say those are probably, right, let's go, let's go three and four. All right. Sandlot and, and Moneyball. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, my top three are my top three are interchangeable, but there's no there's no going away from my top three, which is Kill the Dreams, Bull Durham, and um, The Natural. Those three to me I love are the completely top class. You know, these these two movies are going to be you know interchangeable as far as like four, five, six, seven. You know, because yeah. I've seen so many baseball movies. You know, A League of Their Own is great. Um, for love of the game major league as well 
So we'll get to those next time. Um, I can't wait to talk about time. the Costner, like Bull Durham, yeah. because I'm watching that again. And man, I didn't realize how like raunchy it was. I, you know, like I feel like I watched that as a kid. Again, my mom in the 80s, nobody really cared what you watched, apparently. And uh, I'm watching that. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> did I watch this as a kid? I'm like, this is highly inappropriate. Yeah. I wouldn't let my kids watch. So Extremely. And I think that's one of the movies that kind of got me into, you know, Kevin Costner was such a huge part of my mom's uh, cinematic enjoyment. Yeah. You know, I've seen more <laughs> Kevin Costner movies than I've probably seen of anybody else. And so Feel the Dreams, of course, it's, you know, it, we can go on for, I can go on for days about that movie, just watching yeah. it while I'm doing something else. So it's on in the background. Um, hey, I'm curious. Yeah. What, what was, what's your thoughts on Moneyball? Like in terms of, uh, you know, beyond the David Justice part, just the, um, you know, because how old you were probably, you're a few years younger than me. So during that time, if you remember, like, how did it relate to you um, just in terms of like as a baseball fan? Because I know you're not necessarily an A's fan. So I obviously I have a little more deeper appreciation for it. But just as an, um, a baseball fan, how do you think it represented the that time period, that that season, basically? Because, I mean, that that captivated – I feel like it captivated the baseball world. I mean, 20 games, you know, that was a record until like a couple of years ago. So, you know, it, it was, was definitely something that was on the national, uh, you know, the national scene. So. I remember, you know, I remember a little bit about it. I think at that time I was kind of going through some tough stuff in my life, which is understandable. Um, but looking at the paper, you know, cell phones were were not as as tech as good as what they are now. But then you go yeah. to, you know, seeing it in the movie theaters and remembering everything that was going on. It's like, oh, hey, the A's just won 12 in a row. Hey, the A's won 13 in a row. And I remember that 2002 season, the Braves, the Braves were fair. They were still on their string of 14 straight. So for me, it was always yeah. following them. I've never known okay, yeah. the Braves. Even when they're horrible, I'm still following them. And David Justice, when I saw that he went to the A's, it was like, all right, cool. The movie for me was amazing, of course, you know, going back to how it relates to a baseball fan's perspective and Billy Bean trying to find a way to build a championship team. Um, I don't I don't recall what my thought process was when I was going through it, just because. For me, it was a while ago, you know, yeah. you look at you look at something like that and you kind of go if I was paying attention to what was going on in the world, that would have been great, you know, but I just watched, <laughs> I watched it recently and I've seen it a couple of times and, you know, you look at how the beginning starts and how, you know, Johnny Damon gets on base and then, you know, things just take a turn for the worse. And you're trying to make, you're trying to make things happen and you're trying to work things out. And then you go to the next season. It's like, I just need a little bit more money. And the whole Jonah Hill <laughs> yeah. character and Art Howe and Ron Washington. And I've grown to love Ron Washington. Wow. You know, yeah, Ron Washington. He's, he's the best. He's been a brave coach for the last couple of years. And I'm so thrilled that he won a World Series. And, you know, the kind of people that are involved with a baseball team. And everything that goes into a baseball team and a baseball game and then the family life of it, where, you know, you yep. get to see Brad Pitt in a different light as far as Billy Bean's character. It's just so, for me, it's something that I could get sucked into and I could watch and I can't wait for my kids to be interested in movies like this. You know, Feel the Dreams for them, it's it's one of those movies where I'm going to give it a little bit because I, I know that they won't understand it yet. They've seen this a little heavy, lot. yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's heavy for anybody, you know, because... You know, now they ask me like, hey, dad, did you, you know, do you want to go play catch? Like, yes. Yes, I do. Yes. Like <laughs> yes. The yeah, answers like never that. know. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's cool, so, man. Yeah. Yeah. Moneyball is great, too. Just just because, you know, and this has all been talked about before, but, you know, it's at it, it, the root of it. It's not about baseball. You know, the book, if you read the book, it's not a baseball book. It's a business book. It's about finding a market inefficiency, inefficiency and exploiting it. And that's, you know, and they applied it to baseball. Uh, I think he even ex explains that in the book, you know, you decided to write, it came out to be, it, it just happened to, he set out to write that, you know, that story, but then it just got caught up in a 20 game win season, you know, a 20 game streak and, uh, you know, kind of the narrative wrote itself, but, you know, um, 
you know, if you're going into business, you know, it's a great book to read just because it really shows you how to think outside the box and, uh, you know, not do things that they've always been done. When you don't have the resources to do it, you need to, you need to really think of other ways to do it and to succeed. So, you know, that, that's why I love Moneyball a lot. You know, that's why I really, you know, obviously I said, cause it's about the A's and all, but you know, I just really like how it can be applied you know, not just the baseball. It really is. A, it's a business. It's a business book. And if, if you get a chance to read it, it really comes off, uh, especially the first half, comes off as more of like a business book, you know, how to how to make money in business and how to like, succeed in, and move forward in a business like setting. So that's really, uh, I like that that can be applied elsewhere, you know, other, other, other things about it. So. Awesome. Well, that's a wrap for episode one. 